In last week's video, we walked the Freedom Trail in Boston, Massachusetts, which is an interesting historic hike that features many prominent locations in America's history. For example, this is Paul Revere's house, and coming up here in a second is the Park Street Church, which was once the tallest building in all of the United States. We also got to look at some historic cemeteries in which historical figures have been laid to rest, but probably the coolest thing to me was the USS Constitution. And we got a really, really amazing tour of the ship, and as it turns out, I have enough content to make an entire video about just the USS Constitution. So in today's video, we're going to be taking a look and an in-depth tour by a really great tour guide by the name of Adam, who's going to show us many interesting things and give us some historical insights into what it would have been like on board this ship in the 1700s. It's a really, really beautiful ship and a fantastic tour, so stick around for some really cool stuff. So here we have the USS Constitution, also known as Old Ironsides. She defeated five uh, British warships and during the Battle of 1812, I believe. And it was during the battle with HMS Guerriere that she earned the name Old Ironsides because almost all the cannonballs that, that ship fired upon her practically bounced off the sides. So this is, of course, a wooden ship but because the cannonball somehow miraculously bounced off the sides, she earned the name of Old Ironsides. And this is the oldest ship of any kind that is still afloat today. We can climb this little uh, railing here and go aboard, and it's totally free, which is amazing. Wow, that made a cool sound. Look how beautiful this is. Wow. Three-masted heavy frigate is the technical term. You have this big wooden railing. And here are some of the cannons. Isn't that amazing? Look at that. Wow. Yeah, they're roped down so they don't... Yeah. Yeah, that too. So this here is a hatch, one of the hatches that can go down below decks. I believe there is a hatch that people can actually go down and see what it's like down below. We will be doing that at some point. Look at that. It's so massive. And to think that, you know, when it's sailing under its own power, the power of the wind, you have to go up there and man the sails and go all the way up there into the crow's nest and stuff. You got one on each mast. Amazing. Look at these ropes. Look how big they are. <laughs> Little steps for the sailors to climb up and acti not activate things, but access things. Here's another hatch. This one's not covered, but you can actually look down inside. Now you can see there's another hatch below it. And below that is a third hatch. This cannon has a longer barrel than the others. I don't know if these are like partial cannons or if this is... Yeah, for long range. Long range accuracy. And this here is the area where you can actually go below decks. You can see someone coming out of it right there. <laughs> now we're back here at the rear end of the ship, which I f if I remember correctly is called the stern. It's been a long time since I've read about sailing ships. Look at that. Just imagine standing here and steering the ship wild. Here we have something. I don't actually know what this is. I'm assuming it's for letting light down below decks. Um, that's the captain's guideline. It was to let light and air go down. Aha! That was correct. So that is to let light and air get down into the captain's quarters. Yeah, the captain's skylight. 
Here we have the view. We've got a, another sailing ship over there that's actually sailing. That's really cool. It's not as cool as the USS Constitution, but it's pretty cool. But you know what's interesting about this? There's no rocking at all. Right. This is rock solid. I've never been on a ship like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, now that you mention it, that is pretty wild. That there's... You'd think, I mean, if you look at the water, it is really, really still. On a, on a stormy day, it might rock a little bit, but the, uh, the ship is very, very stable. You'd expect a ship to rock back and forth in the waves, but this is completely solid. There's no motion at all. Here's a compass. That's cool. And now I believe we can head down below decks. And I think we can do it at any one of these. Because there's no rope saying you can't. So we can head down here. Very steep stairs. I'm going to hold on to the railing here. Okay. He said if you turn around, it's easier to go down this way, which he's right, it is. And here we are below decks. The ceiling is very low. It's just right here. We have more cannons. These are longer barreled canyons, cannons. This one's named Spitfire. And this one says Prudence above it. And here is a side view of one of the cannons. We can get to see what it looks like really from the side. We can even do this and look down the, <laughs> the barrel of the cannon. That's terrifying. We can shine a light down the barrel of the cannon and see if there's any rifling, which I don't see. But that's what the inside barrel of a cannon looks like. Wild. Wonder what these barrels would have held long ago. Gunpowder maybe? Or beer? I don't know. Probably gunpowder. There's an area where authorized personnel only are allowed, but I'll still show you. And it still keeps on going. You've got more levels down below. You've got one or two levels down below. And it looks like, oh, no, you can't go down there. But that's how you would. That's how you'd go down there. This here is one of the many ways out of the ship. Here's more barrels. Is this one locked closed? Yeah, I think it's locked closed. Either that or it's the world's heaviest wooden lid. Oh, you can go down. Oh, cool. Let's do that. I'll wait for those people to go down. So this looks like a map of the Boston Harbor and it shows how deep everything is. Soundings in feet. So does that mean it's 40 feet deep in that area? Because that seems really shallow to me. Soundings in feet scale one to 10,000. Huh. Interesting. That's really cool. Then inside here is some stuff, like the captain's quarters and things, probably, presumably. You've got a lovely old table. And you've got stuff over there. You can feel wind blowing in through the... There's actually a bed over there. That's probably where the captain would sleep. Uh, that would, upon impact, it would break open just from the force, 
and that would be able to shoot out like a grenade and hopefully again injure the uh, the crew. Or, yeah, the crew. Uh, and then we had the, the star shot here. So this would open up, so the, the sides here would open up into the shape of an X. Uh, and they would aim that at the sails to punch a giant hole in the sail uh, and cause ripping as well. Uh, that's pretty much. So they would open up after so, the fire. Yep. So these bands wouldn't have been on it, so we would put it just like this. Oh, I uh, see. Just like okay. held so together, like just by the pressed in the can. Yeah. And, yep. and then as soon as the exit is gonna open up uh, and hopefully punch a hole in the sail to prevent from moving. Pretty much a flat tire. You can still kind of use it. Gonna move you a little bit, but not right. enough, not enough to be effective. And then this one, uh, if this flattens your tire this takes the tire off the car. So this is a double-headed shot. It's for the mast, so they're gonna aim it directly at the mast. Uh, it's gonna spin very fast. It's just a bar with a 24-pounder cut in half on each side. And when it hits the mast, ideally it's gonna knock the mast completely off. It's gonna drag in the water. And because it's connected with lines to all the other, the other two masts in the ship itself, it's not gonna just fall off. It's gonna drag it, hopefully take down those masts with it, and if it doesn't take those masts down, it's just gonna drag in the water. They're gonna kinda of move in that direction. You're not gonna be able to maneuver at all. Um, so flattens your tire, takes the tire off, right. essentially. And then as well, this is the last shot that we would have used. It's the bar shot. So all the lines, the rigging that we had that controls the sails, the yards, maneuverability in the ship as a whole, uh, Right now, we have around 50 miles worth from the end to end wow. because we have six sails and then uh, like 12 yards or so uh, the sail came from. They would have had 46 to 48 sails. So they would have had enough lines for all of those. So if we had 50, probably had a few hundred miles worth of lines. Um, so they would. this bar shot uh, is connected by the rings here, you can see, would open up into a line about three feet or so and they would just aim that anywhere at the rigging to tangle that up. Yep, just spin it really fast, hit the rigging, and it would take the rigging out, it would tangle it up, that way you can't drop sail, you can't furl sail, you can't maneuver the ship. Huh. Um, these guns would all be assigned to their different things, so uh, at first they'd be start out with the round shot just to do damage. And as they got closer, these guns might be for the, the mast, so they would just all be shooting double-headed. Once the mast got taken out, or the ship surrendered, then you switch to something else. So if the mass are gone, then you're gonna switch to maybe anti-personnel so they can't fight back. Uh, if you're shooting star shots and the mass goes away, you have no sails to shoot. So again, you're gonna switch to something else. So they all had their own part to play. And ideally, uh, they're gonna disable the ship. So once the ship can't maneuver, can't turn anymore, you're just gonna get either behind it or in front and you're gonna rake it. So raking, is shooting down the length of the entire ship. So normally, you know, you side to side, it's gonna go this 20 feet, 30 feet across the ship uh, and take out every, in between. But if you're going down the length, it's gonna travel the whole length of the ship. So anything in between there is gonna get destroyed. There was a devastating broadside. You had 25 guns and a very small width, but a very long distance. So that's gonna take out everything in between there. So you have one or two of those, enemy is gonna, they're gonna surrender. Uh, they haven't already. Uh, and at that point, you go take their ship, take their prisoners, uh, take the crew as prisoners, make them work for you, do all your work you don't want to do, you know, cleaning, all that kind of gross stuff that nobody wants to do, and then potentially ransom them back to the, to the enemy. That that uh, impressment is what that was called, impressing sailors, so you capture the enemy ship, take the crew, make them work for you. Part of the reason we actually went to war with the British, because they were attacking our trading ships. British and France were at war with each other, uh, and neither of them wanted us to trade with the other side. So because we were trading with the French, they were mad at us. Because we were trading with the British, they decided to attack us. So they were not necessarily targeting our nation, but like it's an American merchant ship. They're gonna target that, take the supplies, take the crew, and force the crew to work for them. Essentially as slave labor, no pay, and we're not allowed to leave the ship, anything like that. Um, so we would, you know, that was a common naval practice, but they did that more than they should have when we weren't at war with them. Um, so that's part of the reason that we actually went to war in 1812. Uh, because they were, you know, affecting our trade, affecting right. our sailors. Do you have any questions for me? I mean, I know there's a lot of information no, I just kind of spit out at you, but... Very, um, very informative. Yes, ma'am. Appreciate it. Oh, so these um, very big poles would be for that capstan right there. So that's a giant winch, essentially. So the anchor is going to be at the front of the ship, at the bow of the ship. And to bring the anchor up, they're going to tie a line so from the capstan... Windless. ...all the way... Yeah, essentially a windless, yes and all the way to the anchor chain and pull it all the way up uh, down to the hose pipes a little bit forward of the ship. And then reattach it, pull it in, reattach it, pull it in. There's also one on the gun deck above us, directly above that, that could be used together or separately. 
Uh, that one would be used more as like a cranch. So they'd throw a line over the yard and they would lift the guns, the supplies out of the main hatch. They were very heavy, so having a winch like that would make it a lot easier. Uh, so we'd have about 40 men on each one. You got about 100 men if you combine them. Um, so yeah, around in the circle, these stairs wouldn't have been here, wide open deck, uh, very easy to do so. You're welcome. That's really cool. So you've got a couple, I came in here a little bit mid your speech, yep. so there's the grape shot and then there's that thing. What exactly yep, are those This is used called for? the canister. So the grape shot would be full of these nine pound balls. Let me unscrew this for you uh, so you can kind of feel it. So obviously these wouldn't have screws in them, mm -hmm. but um, if you want to feel that actually, wow. that's a nine pound, nine pound uh, cannonball right there. Amazing. Uh, if you guys want to feel it as well, it is a little heavy, so just be careful. Okay, I rolled with a nine-pound ball. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to play baseball with that one. No. Yeah. Catch that, and how fast was it going? Uh, I don't actually know how the speed, because again, we haven't. These are replicas. Right. So we haven't fired, you know, anything out of them in a very long time. So these are not the original. They are replicas. They are replicas. Yes. What They're happened not the to original. the originals? You know. Uh, we lost them the time. Uh, just they got recast into other ships, uh, broken, so they had to remake all of them. Cool. What um, so about the ship? How much of that is original? Fifteen percent, roughly. So the keel or the the backbone, the spine of the ship, the very bottom, that's original because you can't really replace the keel without replacing the entire ship. But this is like. Real? But this is a uh, replica, so or restoration, I should say, because the ship is original, but parts of it, most of what you see is not original, so it's restored or replaced. Um, but like I was saying with this. It'd be full of these in a bag, uh, putting the, the bigger and the larger barrels upstairs, and this is just a shotgun, a very big shotgun. <laughs> um, if this went through, you're not gonna have a very fun day anymore. And yeah. It's a pretty big hole. Um, and then you had this canister shot. You guys have seen Pirates of the Caribbean. Oh yeah. Are they, so in the first one, they are they start shoving silverware and other random stuff yeah. down the barrel. Yeah. That's what this is. So this was just a can. They'd fill it with musket balls, silverware, shrapnel maybe that they took from battle. If, you know, something broke, the copper pieces, stuff that in there. Put, you know, like a cloth piece over the top of it just to keep it in. And then when that hits the deck or the mass, it's gonna kind of just, the force of it is gonna cause it to explode. It's essentially a shrapnel grenade at that point. That shrapnel is gonna explode outward. It's going to hopefully kill the crew. If it doesn't crew them or kill them, it's gonna injure them. And they're gonna be out of the fight either way. Uh, so that's what that was for. Wow. Yep. Everything had a purpose. Yeah. That's super cool. Thank you. You're welcome, man. Have a good day. And what is this? That's the match stick. That's actually oh, how they would a, yeah. light the gun. So the nail on one end to, to prime the powder, make sure that it's actually going to go off. And then the other end is going to have this this line here. That's going to be lit on fire. That actually lights, lights the gunpowder. Oh, gun powder. cool. Oh, so they lit this on fire, huh? Yep. So you can see here it's kind of more accurate with like having a large amount. You just kind of like pull it out. Uh, like that and then kind of stop it when you're done. They would have uh, battle lanterns around the deck uh, kind of in the middle so you would just run up to the middle, uh, light it on fire, and then when you're ready it touches the end. Oh right, right, right. Uh, I they wanted to be down here when these cannons were going off. It'd be, you'd lose your hearing, wouldn't you? Absolutely. So, um, as I saying earlier, if you, when the gun would go off, the crew would step to the side and they would cover their ears uh, in an attempt to save their hearing. But that's only for when their gun goes off. So if you have all these other guns going off, you're not going to protect your hearing from. So, I mean, that's not much further away than that is right now. Right. So it really doesn't help you that much. They did what they could. Nice. <laughs> um, but this is the the birth deck, so this is where the crew actually would sleep. We had around 500 men, 450 sailors, 50 marines on this deck alone. Uh, this is actually the only deck they would sleep in. Uh, so as you go back uh, aft here to the, or actually to the front of the ship, this is the uh, the hammocks you can see here. These are what they would sleep in. So they would have hammocks that would go all the way to the very uh, the very back here, and that's what they would sleep in. They would sleep in shifts about four hours. Um, everything was done in shifts, so we'd sleep for four hours, and they'd go eat, and they'd go to watch, or you know, whatever they're doing their job, and they would come down, you know, like do their personal things, you know, write home, write a letter, whatever, and then they go back to sleep uh, for four hours every day. And that's pretty much it, so good luck trying to sleep while on a ship. Yeah. Um, but they all had two hammocks like that. They're pretty comfortable, um, but again, they're pretty small, so better than sleeping on the deck, though. So they would sleep, put their hammock up, take their nap, their four hour nap. Uh, take it down, put it over to the side, show it to the side with their stuff, and then let the, the next the next shift or the next you know group 
uh, duty section kind of come take their vet, their rest. Um, so you'd start all the way uh, forward of the ship. Um, I'm gonna go there because we got like harnesses for climbing because we actually do climb. It's very crazy, but it's very fun. Um, all the way forward, you'd have like a curtain off area. That'd be the sick bay. So that's where all the the injured and sick sailors would have. We have. Um, Mainly from, from sickness more than from battle injury because we weren't in battle that often. So we have like scurvy if they weren't, you know, eating their, their veggies. Uh, night blindness for the ones that stayed down below decks a lot. Uh, would get blind from being in the dark so much that when they went out in the light, oh, yeah. uh, they would be pretty much blind. Um, wow. Just because they're used to the dark. Get kind of golemized, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, and other kind of things like that. A lot of STDs, um, it's actually unknown. We gotta talk about it. Um, so yeah. I'm not gonna go into detail, but <laughs> uh, 500 men on a ship for six months. It's, it's something's gonna happen between someone. So yeah. uh, things like that. And they would kind of stay up there, kind of away from everyone else. So they're not spreading their diseases, uh, their grossness. And they would have um, what's called lob lolly boys. So uh, part of the crew, we had eight to 12 year old boys. So they would do a lot of the, the cleanup stuff. So they would empty the poop buckets. They would clean up the injured people, um, that kind of that kind of thing uh, that no one else wanted to do. Um, and then moving forward, you have all the enlisted men. So inboard the ship, so the very center of the ship, you have all of the fresh new sailors who never were on the ship. They were uh, unused to being on the waves that rolled. So we get seasick easy. So go in the middle, it's the least amount of rock. Uh, then all the old salts who were used to this would be up against the hole here, against the side, where you can see these, uh, these airports uh, or portholes that were Pretty much just for light and air. I know it looks like a gun port there. Get that question a lot, but it is actually just for air and light. We're too close to the water line uh, for that to be an effective gun port. Um, so the salts would get over there, so a lot more, a lot rockier, a lot less steady. But you get the air and the light that those provide, uh, and they could be locked up with the uh, the plugs on the ground there. Um, and then if you went forward more, you have the uh, the Marines. So the Marines would sleep between the enlisted crew and the officers. So um, so we had midshipmen, marines, midshipmen, and then the officers in the wardroom in the back there, that separate cabin. And they would also be the peacekeeping. So when they were on board the ship, they would protect the, the weapon stores, the, the food supplies, make sure no one was stealing from each other, stuff like that. And they would protect the officers from the sailors, because 500 sailors, maybe 30 officers at max. Uh, so definitely there's gonna be a lot of tension there between sailors and officers if they sleep too close together. Mm -hmm. So the marines would be pretty much like right here-ish, mm -hmm. uh, with all their weapons, you know, protecting the enemy. Again, same sleeping arrangements though, so uh, it'd be a lot more cramped though. I mean, you know, again, 500 men. Right. And then again, you have another curtained off area right around here, and beyond that would be the midshipmen. So, their midshipmen are officers in training, so they're trained to become officers, not officers yet though. Uh, so they would be like 15 year old boys a lot of the time, very young. Um, learning how to uh, read, write, if they didn't already know, how to command, how to do the washes, the logs, everything like that. Uh, and they would have like chests, they would have nicer hammocks, a bit more spacious, a bit more private. Uh, and then back here, we would have the actual um, wardroom. So I'm not going to go in there because then the guy, the tour guide in there, he's okay. doing his thing. Uh, feel free to like. Go see, say hi to him. Uh, he's back there looking at the magazine. So this is the wardroom where the officers would sleep in. Uh, so the commission officers would sleep on one side, the uh, starboard side, which is that side, and then the warrant officers would sleep on this side. So commissioned were the ones in charge. So the first lieutenant was second in command, then second lieutenant, third lieutenant, fourth, and fifth. The, the warrant officers were actually um, the ones who had like tr trade masters. So the sailing master was in charge of sailing the ship and navigation. The carpenter was in charge of the actual wood on the ship, so making sure that the support went out, he could replace it. If there was a hole in the side, he could fix it. Uh, the bosun was in charge of all the lines and the rigging on the ship, so everyone had, had their own purpose. Uh, the commission officers also included the surgeon, so every ship had a surgeon and then a surgeon mate, so the doctor and his nurses all have been to med school. Uh, they had all been to med school, they had all um, done that. Um, they actually did their surgeries down below here, so if you want, we can go down there because I'm giving you guys a special tour. Oh, sweet. Um, so Let's do it. Actually, Thank you. I'm have you go down there and just stay down there. Uh, All right, sure. Don't double around and then we'll close this after us. No problem. Wow. We get to go places not everyone does. Thank you so much. Yeah, so it is very short, so be very careful. Um, so this is the surgeon's cockpit. So as you can see, we use it for storage for certain things. But No, so this is uh, where they would actually 
it's like cabins for the, the injured people. So the operating table will be pretty much right here. They have crates kind of stacked in a table like layout. Uh, they put them on there. It's painted red so that you can't see the blood on the deck. You know, that would, might freak out patients. Uh, it sounds funny, it's, it's like Deadpool, so you don't see the blood, but it's actually why it was red. Uh, then this little cabin on the side was for the patient that needed an operation to sleep in. Now you might think it'd be smarter to have more space here so you can stand for your operations, but in reality, if you're standing and you got a big old saw in your hand about to cut someone's leg off and uh, the ship rocks because you know it's on the ocean, then all of a sudden you cut the wrong spot. So if you're on your knees, as you can see, you're going to have a lot less uh, movement when the ship is rocking. So they purposely made this because you're always going to have some cocky surgeon or surgeon mate who thinks he knows what's up and then the ship hits a random gust of wind and now he kills someone by accident. So uh, if you're on your knees, it's a lot, a lot sturdier. Um, so that's actually what this is for. Uh, and then you had more bread and food storage back here. Uh, through those doors, it'd be, it opens up a lot. Uh, I don't think I'm going to bring you guys down there today, but um, that's pretty much this entire deck would be... It's called the Orlop. It's where they would store all their food and water and other supplies like that. Would all be down here. This would be, past this room would be completely full. You wouldn't be able to walk through there at all. You have to walk along the side of the ship along the pole where it kind of curves and can't fit stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you guys have any questions about this room or like this deck? I know, again, I'm spitting a lot of information at you guys. That's great, yeah. yeah. I, I can't think of any questions though. off the top of my head, but it's cool. Is there, is there anything below here? Like, um, Yep, so this is just more of the same. So this is kind of like a split level. So it's like I said, it opens up. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's going to be more storage space beneath this as well. Very cool. Um, we don't store anything down there now. It's kind of hard to get to. But yeah. Yeah, there'd be a lot more space. Food and stuff. Yep, so they had enough. They had, needed to have enough water and food to get to the next port. So, around three months of water and six months of food wow. is how much they would have on board before they needed to stop at port to refill. So, that's the max I could say at sea. But then, if it went to port, of course, you can fill up and keep going. Uh, so, usually, they wouldn't be out for more than six months. You know, they would try not to at least uh, go out for like six months to a year, then come back and then you know do it again. How long would you have to be at sea before you get scurvy? Uh, I'm not actually sure on how long it would take to get scurvy. What they would do is on the gun deck, they had a barrel of uh, grog, which is a one part water, one part rum. That's, they wouldn't have a ration for that. So the higher ranking you were, the more rations you got every day. So the captain got maybe, maybe the captain got 10, and the lowest the other got one, you know, or half a ration. Um, and they would fill those barrels with lemons and limes and other citrus fruit. So that way, when they're drinking their grog for the day, because everyone wants grog after a long day, uh, you know, the myths about, you know, sailors drinking, you know, it's pretty true. Um, it's pretty accurate, especially back then, a lot more than it is today. Um, so everyone's drinking that. They'd have the lemons and limes. It's going to last a lot longer if you just put that in there, and it prevents the scurvy uh, for the most part. Cool. James, you want to go look in that room? Yeah. I think, all in there. yeah. If you got, once we go back up, you guys go in the war room, the, the two, some of the cabins against the back there actually are furnished with uh, what it would have looked like. Oh, cool. Yeah, I saw that. I saw yep. that. So this here is a little room it's being used for storage right now, but sick um, people and doing operations would be in there. So we took her out July 4th, actually. Uh, yep, so we take her out in August. Yeah, so about eight times. Uh, so we go out to uh, Castle Island, it's about five miles out from the port. Uh, we go there, we come back, we do a 21 gun salute, and then a 17 gun salute on the way back. We'll do uh, historical reenactments of pike drills and gun drills, we'll fire off some muskets, you know, fire the guns for the, the salutes and whatnot. Um, and we'll also do climbing, so we haven't done it yet, but hopefully I think this next sail we're going to actually set the sails uh, up top. Um, if not this one, the one after that. Uh, we've got a few more left this year, so we'll actually set the sail, see what other people see us climbing, see the gun go off, kind of like announce our presence to the world, like show them that like we're still America's ship of state, we're still in the Navy, we're still floating, we can still sail, like we are still here, we're, uh, we're not just some museum ship. Mm -hmm. like, a lot of people do think that it's still dry doctor, it doesn't commission, but it is, it is, it is part of America's history. And how did you get this job? Did you ask for it? Was it volunteer? So, uh, for myself, I came from boot camp, actually. So, in boot camp, I never even heard of this shit before. It's not like taught about that much mm -hmm. uh, in history uh, as it should be. But I went to boot camp, and towards the end of boot camp, about halfway through, they're like, okay, about like the RDCs or the drill instructors, like, hey, we got, uh, if you guys want, you can apply to go to the Constitution after this before you go to your rating school. Uh, so, before I learn my job, I'll actually, I mean, I'm here first. Um, because the Navy, like the needs of the Navy, 
for my rate, my selected MOS, my job, they didn't need me that at, right at that moment. So they were like, all right, you know what? We can give you those two years to come here instead. Be a nice, fresh sailor, you know, doing everything right, you know, look good for, for the camera, I hope. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, but, um, so that's how, and there was an application with some paperwork, and then we had to do an interview with the command senior chief, who is the highest ranking uh, enlisted member here, and then she makes the recommendations to the captain. The captain looks at the sailors like, portfolio, quote unquote. So from boot camp is pretty small. Uh, if you're from the fleet, you might look at like, is he a good sailor? Does he have good review? Is he evaluation? Stuff like that. And then the captain hand selects who comes here. So the entire crew is, is handpicked uh, as, a, as a good crew. Um, so we do have a very good crew. It's a very prestigious command. We got a lot of high ranking people. Um, the president has visited before in the past. I don't think he's gonna visit anytime soon. Uh, but we get like those, we get celebrities sometimes. I think Will Ferrell came at one point. Um, and then within the Navy, we get a lot of like officers. We do a lot of ceremonies, retirements, promotions, that kind of stuff. Uh, so you meet a lot of people. I know somebody got uh, who was trying to get to the Naval Academy after already being enlisted. You have to apply for that, and they only select like a thousand a year. It's a very small number, and it might even be less than that. And the Secretary of the Navy was visiting. So the Secretary of Defense, Secretary of the Navy, and then like everything else. Uh, so he was here visiting and the sailor talked to him and actually mentioned that and the Secretary of the Navy wrote a recommendation letter for him to get into the Naval Academy. So you mentioned the keel was original. Does it leak? Does it leak? Yeah. Um, so it being a wooden ship, it does leak over time. Uh, right. So that's what we have. Those bilge pumps on the gun deck, because mm -hmm. it leaks over time, they have to pump that out. We have automatic ones today, so we have to make sure it's not flooding. How would they have? Day. How would they have drained it out back in the 1800s? Say. So those bilge pumps. I don't know if I talked about it for, to you guys up there, uh, but there's those copper like pots on. The oh ground. yeah, I was wondering what those were. Yeah. So those are the bilge pumps. So those actually uh, are hand pumps that pump water out from the bottom. Oh uh, wow. Pipes, okay. And they dump it out on the gun deck, so that way. Uh, the gun deck is wet so that you can, um, when there's sparks and gunpowder everywhere from the battle, it's not gonna cause Oh, that makes a lot of sense. And then you can push it out through portholes and stuff. Mm -hmm. Really cool. I used to have an old boat, old wooden boat. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, I, could, I couldn't hardly keep that thing afloat. It, it had two bilge pumps. Oh, wow. And it was only a 19 foot, I think. Yeah. yeah, yeah we were a pretty good job keeping the ship in good shape. She was in dry dock in. 2017, I believe, and uh, they took the underneath the water line. There's copper plating along the entire hull to keep out. There's like sea worms that like, burrow into the wood and oh, yeah. eat it and cause holes. So they have copper sheeting along that entire entire side there to keep that from happening. And in 2017, they decided to take that off just to make sure that the side was good and everything was in perfect condition underneath. They had wow. like, pretty much no reason to take it off except to check. Um, so we do a very good job keeping it in shape. So how long do you put it, how often do you put it in uh, dry dock? Dry dock? I believe it's like every 10 to 15 years or as needed. So if the mast broke right now, we put it in dry dock because it has to be fixed. And you can't fix the mast in the water. Um, so if there's any major damage, you put it in dry dock. Otherwise, uh, it'd be like every 15 years just for like the usual repairs, place when needs to be replaced. Mm -hmm. How often do things like that break? I mean, I think a mast would break. Not, no, not very often, not right, at all. Yeah, but right. uh, sometimes things like wood occasionally rots, so maybe something rots and you don't notice until it's too late to just like fix it. Mm -hmm. um, one of the fighting tops, the plank deck planks are oh, yeah, yeah. starting to go, so they had to replace that, but thankfully it's something they can do just here, mm -hmm. closing off portions of the ship. So um, those kind of things don't happen very often. Mm -hmm. um, so, so those those fighting, what do you call them on the, on the top? Fighting tops. Fighting fighting tops. So yep. I've heard the term crow's nest used before. Is that the same as that or is that uh, different? No. So crow's nest traditionally would be more like a small basket, like all the way at the top of oh, the okay. mast. Okay. We don't have those. Um, we use the fighting tops because those fighting tops were actually for fighting. The mm -hmm. Marines would go up there with muskets and fire, try to take out the enemy officers cool, very and cool. crew. Um, lookouts would just have to hang on the shroud on the, mm -hmm. on the rigging on the side at the top. Gotcha, gotcha. Very cool. Yeah. If you guys have any more questions, we'll head back up. All right, sounds good. Hey, thank you. Thank you Absolutely. so much, Adam. Yeah, just wash your head as you come up. Check that out. I think this must be like part of the st core structure of the ship, if I had to guess. And then look at this. Up at the top there, it says port turn, starboard turn. I wonder what that's for, steering? I don't know what that's for. This is just the other side of that room. 
Here's the battle lanterns that uh, our new friend was talking about. They'd hang these under the deck. And you can just come over here and have a seat. And you've got some uh, skylights up here to allow light to come down here because, of course, back in the day they wouldn't have had the uh, electric lights. So this helped allow light to come down here. And, of course, they'd have lanterns like we've seen, the battle lanterns and other such things. But the skylights help with that, too. Here are some rooms that are furnished. So we can kind of see what the cabin of the fourth lieutenant w might have looked like. Pretty small, but it's got most of the things you need. So um, this right here is actually the aft magazine. So I'm not gonna bring you down up there. Mm -hmm. It's very small. Right. Um, but this is where they would store their shots and their gunpowder. Oh, down cool. in there, they have a small copper lined room in there. Uh, with all the gunpowder beads, copper lines, so there's no sparking against the walls or anything mm -hmm. like that. Uh, then the ship's boys, 8 to 12 years old, would be down there and they would pass uh, the gunpowder and the shots up through the decks. Gotcha. As needed. Neato. Let's see what's in here. Another furnished room. The fifth lieutenant. This room is not furnished. I don't think any of the others are, but they've got two of the furnished rooms to give you an idea of what it would have actually looked like back in the day. And here's a list of the all the first lieutenants of the USS Constitution from 1798 all the way down to 2011. That's amazing. Oh, it goes even further. They have another one over here. 2019. What's this? Ship's inclinometer, an instrument for showing the inclination of the ship relative to the hori horizontal. Yeah. So I guess they'd use that to tell if the ship was listing or something. Yeah. <laughs> this, I think, is part of the bilge pump system, because above. On the upper floor, there's more of that. I wonder what this was for. Interesting. It's like a sink or something in there. What was this used for? Uh, that's the uh, midshipman's pantry. So uh, after her time as a warship, so pretty much after the War of 1812, she transitioned to more of a lot like training. So she would do diplomatic missions. Um, she went around the world in the 1840s. Oh, wow. Uh, and after that, she went even more so like towards the Civil War. She was a receiving ship, so it was more of a barracks mm -hmm. at that point. So they added uh, things like this in, the midshipman's pantry, the captain's skylight, to make life easier. So this is... You know, it's kind of a sink in there, so mm -hmm. it's a sink, uh, storage for like silverware and whatnot, because this is actually where they would eat, would be on this deck. Gotcha, gotcha. They'd bring the food down here and eat, mm -hmm. so they was, uh, it was literally just a closet. <laughs> just a closet. Yep, I know it seems a lot more important, but it's <laughs> pretty much just a closet. That's cool. That's really cool. And so this is a part of the bilge pump system you were talking about, right? Yep, so those are actually the pipes that I lead down below. Okay. Um, I don't know how it works, but... Mm -hmm. uh, I know it's a, it's a hand pumps up and down, and I'm assuming this goes up and down with it. Mm -hmm. And why was copper used so often in, of, of, as opposed to um, any other metal? It was easy to clean, it didn't rust. Mm -hmm. So, like, copper will like, turn, it'll get, you know. Tarnished, yeah. Yeah, yeah but. The patina. Uh, if, uh, they'll, they would shine this every day. Um, that's just part of daily chores. So, so is that the original copper from. No, so all the copper would get replaced every pretty much every time we went to dry dock. Oh, okay. So it would get replaced often just because copper does eventually. Right. It's pretty weak metal, but it was a lot easier to clean. It wouldn't go rusty. It was very light mm -hmm. as well. So and if it was all iron, it'd be makes ship a lot heavier. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so easy to clean, uh, very light. Wonderful. Thank you so much for the tours, Ben. You are absolutely welcome. Uh, like I said, there's two guys as well on every mm -hmm. deck, deck as well. So if you have any questions, find me, find one of them. Uh, anyone who's 
in this uniform to active duty. Cool. Uh, so we're all here for you guys to answer your questions. Thank you so much for your service. You're welcome. You're welcome. Glad to help you guys out. Yeah. Earlier on in the video, I commented on the ship's wheel and how awesome it is. And I learned a really interesting tidbit about it is that this actually isn't original to the ship. And in fact, it's not even of American design. The double ship's wheel is actually a British design. Um, during one battle, I believe in the, 18, the War of 1812, the entire... Uh, steering and wheel mechanism got completely obliterated and this was actually taken from a enemy British ship and installed onto the USS Constitution. I believe that is all correct. One of the tour guides told us that and uh, I believe I remembered that correctly. So that is a really interesting little tidbit about the beautiful ship's wheel here. And while we're uh, up here on the deck we can take one more look up here at the masts and the rigging. It's really really impressive. Can you imagine 500 men on this one ship? That's how many it took to run it. Right. But that's still a hell of a lot of people. Alright, you too. Thank you so much, Adam. She is a beautiful ship, that's for sure. And it's so incredible that since the 1700s, she's still afloat on the seas. That's so cool. There are massive anchors for a massive ship. Behind me here is dry dock number one, which is where the USS Constitution would be dry docked if she needed to go in for repairs. It's quite the sight. There's not really that much I can really say about it because I don't know that much about dry docks, but there you go. It would fill up with water. I assume that gate would open and water would flow in and then they could bring the USS Constitution in and repair her. Over here is a wonderful placard, one of the best I've seen. It's actually really interesting, talking about the... Um, the, the types of wood that the that the ship would need. This is a hanging knee that they would need for this type of part of the ship. And so that apparently can only come from a certain part of a certain type of tree. Um, and live oak trees yield frames and knees that support the ship. Woods that were plentiful in the 1800s are harder to obtain today. Locating the wood appropriate to the ship's original specifications are an ongoing challenge. And here's some really interesting stuff about how the ship was built and what type of wood and nails were used to put it together. A significant percentage of her original wood still exists below the waterline. The tour guide um, that we talked to said that there's copper plating beneath the waterline. Maybe this is, uh, I don't know if that's copper plating or not, but at some point they put copper plating on the hull of the ship to prevent uh, like aquatic worms from digging into the wood and eating it. And in 1992, when they dry docked it, they removed that copper plating just to check and make sure that the ship was still good underneath and it was in perfect condition underneath the copper plating. So here are some pictures you've already seen a little bit. I'll read the captions here. This is in 1927 when they assessed it for repairs. 1928 when they're hewing planks by hand. And here's them, um, people trimming the mast with a power saw. That is one heck of a saw in 1963. And here's some pictures from the 90s where they're inspecting the hull in dry dock and removing the mast before dry docking it. And then here's another picture of it when it's in the dry dock at some point. Really cool stuff. These are really great. Serving the fleet. By 1940, this Navy Yard supported a powerful fleet of modern steel ships, where once carpenters, joiners, and sailmakers responded to the morning shipyard bell, now a shrill steam whistle summoned welders, boilermakers, and electronic specialists to their workstation. The yard in 1960 would have looked something like this, with aircraft carriers and things like that. That concludes our wonderful tour of the USS Constitution. Thank you very much to our wonderful tour guide, Adam, both for being an awesome tour guide and also thank you for his services in the military. 
The USS Constitution is an incredible ship, and although it's totally possible to enjoy this video, it is not impossible to enjoy this video as much as it is to enjoy going on board the USS Constitution and seeing it for yourself. If you're ever in Boston, definitely drop by the USS Constitution. Like I said, it's totally free to go on board, talk to wonderful tour guides, maybe you'll even get to meet Adam and see some of these awesome things for yourself. The scale of the ship and the scale of honestly everything on board really doesn't portray very well through the video. Everything is massive and it's just so cool to get to do this. Thank you very much for watching this video. I really hope you all did enjoy the video and if you did, thank you very much. Thank you for subscribing and I will see you in the next video. Goodbye.